Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. One of the most famous arguments given by the Sindhi nationalist is that Raja Dahir was the hero who protected Sin and Muhammad bin Qasim was the thief who plundered Sin. This picture on the left is the one they often show while talking about Raja Dahir, although in fact it actually belongs to a Rajasthani prince named Raja Madhu Singh II who had nothing to do with Raja Dahir. Such arguments leave a normal Sindhi confused as to who exactly was the hero of Sindh. Was it Raja Dahir, Muhammad bin Qasim, or somebody else? To understand this, we need to go back to Sindh's history. We don't really know much about who ruled Sindh since the destruction of Mohenjo-daro from the Indus Valley civilization. Also, we don't know how it was destroyed or who destroyed it. We know from sources that Sindh was part of several empires after that such as the Persians, the Indo-Greeks, and the empire of Alexander the Great. The first properly known Sindhi rulers of Sindh were the Rai dynasty and this dynasty was founded by a Buddhist prince named Rai Divaji. Some say he was a descendant of the Mauryan emperors like Ashoka and others, but we don't really know about that and this has not been confirmed even today. The rulers respected uh, Buddhism and Hinduism because both were Dharmic religions with Buddha himself being a Hindu prince in his early life and the rulers themselves were Buddhist, not Hindu. And although most Sindhis in the, generally in the lower region, followed Buddhism, there were some Hindu communities as well. The kingdom extended all the way to the frontiers of Kashmir on one side and on the other side all the way to the frontiers of Sistan and Balochistan province in Iran. The family tree of Rai kings probably looks something like this according to the Chachnama which gives us some hints as well as the dates of all rulers. It says that Rai Sahiras II was the great-grandson of Rai Divaji. And it also says that Rai Sahasi II was the grandson of Rai Sahasi I. And it tells us that under Rai Sahiras II, the second last ruler of the state, Sindh was very prosperous and the coffers overflowed with the treasure. And it also says that he was a justice-loving and a tolerant king. He divided his kingdom for the sake of administration into four regions. Some were ruled by vassal kings and some by governors, but we don't know which of these regions were vassals and which were under direct control. We just know that other than the capital Aror, there were four regions and these were Multan, which extended all the way till the Kashmir frontier. The Brahmanabad region was based in Nehrun Kot, which is now Hyderabad, Pakistan, not the Indian Hyderabad. Sivistan was located quite close to Brahmanabad and now forms what is called Sivan Sharif. And Iskandar region was in Punjab in the areas near Rawalpiti. King Sahasi II came to the throne after his father was killed fighting the king of Nimruz in modern day Afghanistan. And he was married to Rani Sohandi, also known as Sohandivi, but she didn't like her husband because they had no children and also because the king was suffering from health issues. Around this time, two Brahmin Hindu brothers entered the court. Their names were Chach and Chandra, sons of Silaji. Their grandfather was named Bisas according to the Chachnama. As mentioned earlier, these brothers were Brahmins and according to a source published in 1823, Brahmins aren't actually natives of the Indian subcontinent but rather they came from the north through the Haridwar Pass which is still very significant for Brahmin Hindus even today. Although it is still a bit you know mysterious, while according to ethnic Sindhis they are not descended from invaders but they are actually descended from the people of Mohenjo-daro and the Indus Valley civilization who were supposedly natives because we don't really know where they came from. And as for the uh, Aryan invasion theory which says that some Iranic people invaded the subcontinent and then just took over, well we don't really know whether it actually happened or not. There's some evidence to say it did happen and there's also evidence to say that it did not happen.
I've also heard from some people that Raja Dahir was a Kashmiri Brahmin. And although there were Kashmiri Brahmin princes in Sindh at that time, I would really appreciate if you could provide a source in the comments if you have found. Because it's hard to you know say something when you don't really have evidence. Although many people refer to something called Sindhiana Encyclopedia. But then again, I've not included this in our video because I myself could not find the Sindhiana Encyclopedia online. So if you know any evidence about whether this Sindhiana Encyclopedia even exists or whether Dahir was a Kashmiri or not, please share in the comments below. In a turn of events, a judge managed to uh, get closer to the Rani who by this time was already unhappy with her husband. Around 632, the king passed away and the Rani conspired with judge and had him installed on the throne. Rai Maharit challenged Judge's claims because Judge was a usurper, but Judge slew him in battle and then married the Rani, becoming the official king of Sin. He had three children with the Rani, and around 671, Judge passed away. He was succeeded by his brother Chandra, who was a famous Hindu priest as well. According to the Judge Nama, Chandra ruled for seven years and he died between 678 and 679. The reason I'm saying this is because the Judge Nama follows the Islamic calendar and not the calendar we normally use. As a result, there is a difference of dates while converting the dates from Islamic calendar to the one we normally use, the Gregorian one. And was, uh, um, sorry, Chandra was succeeded by Raja Dahir. As we all know, Raja Dahir was the last Hindu ruler of Sindh. It is a famous story that Dahir once visited an astrologer and asked him, who is the most successful person in the future? The astrologer uh, took the horoscope and said that according to the horoscope, it's going to be your sister's husband. Dahir left the astrologer and then began to wonder that if his sister's husband was going to be the most successful person, then he could just marry his own sister. He sent a letter to his brother telling him about the situation and when he heard this, he got mad. That was because marrying your own sister is not something allowed in Hinduism and so he decided to go and stop the hair once for all. However, according to the Judge Nama, this marriage was a ceremonial one and was just meant to make sure the hair becomes husband of his own sister so the prophecy becomes true and also to make sure his sister couldn't marry anyone else lest there was a threat to his throne. Officially, the marriage did not involve any physical relations, yet many people, including Dahir's own brother, was offended. However, before he could even face Dahir, he, his brother died of diseases. And according to the Judge Nama, Raja Dahir was very sad and tore off his own turban and wept loudly upon hearing the news that his brother was no more. He then married his own sister and according to Judge Nama also attended the cremation of his brother, although some people say he didn't. Judge Nama says that his viziers told him not to attend the cremation but he said that he will and he did. Now Muslims did exist in the Indian subcontinent even before Raja Dahir. And most of these were Arabs, but some were probably Sindhi converts to Islam as well. The first Muslim invasion was the Battle of Rasil that was during the time of Rashidun Caliph, Hazrat Umar, peace be upon him. This battle extended the Caliphate's frontier to Makran, which was traditionally part of Sindh at that time, but today it's Balochistan. Sin was generally a very tolerant place with Muslims and Hindus and people of other religions peacefully living together. But when Judge came to power, he defeated a Sindhi Buddhist king named Agam Luhana who ruled over Brahmanabad. And then his people, the Luhanas, who were mainly Buddhists, were discriminated. Judge probably underestimated the fact that Lower Sin had a Buddhist majority and even today lots of ruins of Buddhist stupas and idols of Buddha have been found. And by doing such stuff, Church was angering the Lohana community. 
his uh, orders regarding the Lohanas were that they could not wear any headgear, they could not wear dresses made of silk or velvet, and they could not ride horses with a saddle. So if they wanted to ride a horse, they would put a blanket and then ride it. We might argue that even though this discrimination was harsh, it was for political, not religious reasons because Agam Lohana refused to recognize church. However, it is also known that church forbade all the Sindhi Buddhist charts from wearing satin hats and soft garments. They had to wear woolen garments, stay bareheaded, and whenever they went outside, they needed to bring a dog with themselves and walk barefoot. This was done for the sake of identification so that each and every Sindhi Buddhist jat would be identified and if they refused to do this, they were fined. And as a result, many Sindhi jats did not like the Brahmin dynasty because they had destroyed Sindh's religious harmony. It was around this time that Sindhi pirates also became quite popular, although they had existed for many years but now an event was about to take place that would make them famous. These Sindhi pirates were known as the Bavrij in Arabic language sources and their bases were in Gujarat and Sindh. So the king of Sri Lanka decided to send some gifts for the caliph and on board were also some Muslim women who were related to Muslims who had settled down in Sri Lanka and some of them even married locals. They were going to meet their families and to perform pilgrimage, but a storm caused the convoy to head towards the coast of Debel, which is very close to the modern day site of Karachi's coastline. And at this point, the Sindhi pirates boarded the ship. The officers and the women told them to stay away because they were going to the caliph, but the Sindhi pirates refused and they abducted everyone and seized all the gifts. Judge Nama tells us that a group of survivors did manage to escape from the scenario and reach Hajjad bin Yusuf, the governor of Iraq, who all sources agree was a very cruel man. They told him about what happened and they even told him about a particular incident where a woman from the Banu Aziz tri tribe cried out, Hajjaj come and help me. When Hajjaj heard this, he got very frustrated and wrote a letter to Raja Dahir in which he requested punishment of the Sindhi pirates as well as release of the captives and their goods. However, Raja Tahir's reply was that these were non-state actors so he could not do anything to either help the people or to even punish the Sindhi pirates. Hajjaj had a feeling that something fishy was going around because the incident had taken place in Dibal and Dibal was ruled by Tahir's own nephew and so he decided to send military expeditions. The first one was defeated and almost everyone in it was executed except for some who were taken prisoner. Same happened to the second one but Hajjaj did not give up. He came up with a third expedition and this one was under the command of his nephew and son-in-law Muhammad bin Qasim who at this time was only 17 years old. Lots of reasons have been given as to why Muhammad bin Qasim actually attacked Sindh. The first reason is the story mentioned in Chachnama which we have just discussed. The second reason is given by some Sindhi nationalists that Raja Dahir had given refuge to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's descendants. We do know obviously that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's descendants and his blessed companions were political opponents to the Umayyads because the Umayyads has us had usurped the caliphate from the, the right. Like it was the right of all Muslims to choose the caliph but they just took it. And that's why the fitnas and all that happened. But however, the truth is that nothing like this happened. In other words, even though there were political issues between the descendants and all that, none of them actually, you know, sought asylum in Sindh. But Raja Dahir did give refuge to a group of Muslims but these Muslims were not related by family to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. They were basically an Arab tribe known as the Alfis who had, one, who had been one of the first to embrace Islam amongst the Arab tribes. And why he gave them refuge was basically they killed the governor of Makran for political reasons 
and then they fled to Sin, allied with Raja Dahir and even raided some Umayyad lands. Long story short, Raja Dahir gave refuge to some fugitives. And a fun fact is that the Muslim Abbasid historian Ibn Qutayba writes that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's great grandson Hazrat Imam Zainul Abdeen peace be upon him had a wife from Sindh whose name is given in Arabic sources as Jada as Sindhi. Her Sindhi name was probably Joda and they had at least one child Hazrat Zaid bin Ali peace be upon him. So Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did have Sindhi descendants but then again there is no record of these descendants ever appearing in Sin around the time of this incident and Raja Dahir episode. So the whole claim of Raja Dahir giving refuge to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's family is just a made up story which didn't really exist. So there were two ways for Muhammad bin Qasim to reach Sin. The first was by sea and the second was by land. Hajjaj told Muhammad bin Qasim to go by land so that the auxiliaries could also join him. They started in Shiraz in Iran and from there they arrived in Makran which is now located in Pakistan's Balochistan province and from there they were supposed to reach Debal. Muhammad bin Qasim's first mission was to free the prisoners and punish the Sindhi pirates. Debal was ruled by Raja Dahir's nephew and he had a moderate number of men at arms who could for some time hold out. As mentioned earlier, Hajjaj was by no doubt a ruthless man, but most of his ruthlessness was about dealing with political opponents. He was supporting the Umayyads who had usurped the Caliphate and so many of their political opponents were the companions and descendants of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and yes he was very harsh with them. You can read it in detail in history. Hajjaj also sent uh, instructions to Muhammad bin Qasim regarding how the people of Sindh should be treated. He said if they offer even a little resistance they should be killed or enslaved and if they offer no resistance then they should be befriended and of course protected. On the way to Dibal, Muhammad bin Qasim met Sindhi and Balot Jats in Makran. They said that they wanted to join him and so he allowed them. Once they reached Dibal, they started laying siege to the city, but the governor held out successfully. In the end, a Brahmin named Shudev or Sohdev appeared and asked for amnesty from Muhammad bin Qasim. When Muhammad bin Qasim gave him the amnesty, he told him that some of the astrologers were talking about a Muslim conqueror who would capture the whole of Sin. And then he told them that you see that large temple with the large flagstaff, there's a talisman kept under this flagstaff and if you break it, you will win. Muhammad bin Qasim ordered his engineer to position their largest catapult which was nicknamed the Bride to attack that flagstaff. He was also promised a reward if he did it successfully and so he did it. Once the people of Debal saw that their flagstaff was gone, they decided to surrender and open the gates. But Jashnama says that Hajjad's orders were strictly followed and for three days there was looting and most men were killed and around 700 females were captured and sent to Hajjaj. Then Muhammad bin Qasim restored order and announced religious freedom for the citizens. He ordered all the Muslim prisoners to be brought to him and he had them free. It was at this point that the locals uh, took him to the Hindu master who had been the custodian of all the Muslim prisoners and upon meeting him Muhammad bin Qasim ordered him to be executed. The Hindu master said that he had one last wish. He wanted Muhammad bin Qasim to ask the Muslim prisoners about how he had treated them and Muhammad bin Qasim agreed to grant him his final wish. The prisoners were brought and questioned and they replied that this Hindu master was a man of respect who helped them in their worst of time. Even though they were trapped in the dungeons in the prison, this Hindu master kept telling them that one day you will eventually be saved. Upon seeing this, Muhammad bin Qasim cancelled his orders and then invited the Hindu master to become a Muslim. 
and he agreed, becoming the first known person to have converted to Islam during the expedition. A mosque was built in the city of Dibal and a colony of some 4,000 Muslims was established in a part of the city. We do not really know where Dibal was, but most likely it was located somewhere near the site of modern-day Karachi, although it has been suggested by some that the city of Bambor is the same as Dibal. And although we are not once again sure, but we do know that ruins of a very ancient mosque have been found in the city of Bambor. To be very exact, only the floor now remains. So it is possible that this is the same city as Dibal, because that's where the first mosque was built. Although once again, we are not so sure about it. After conquering Dibal, Muhammad bin Qasim decided to capture the city of Nehrunkot, which is now Hyderabad. It was ruled by a Buddhist priest who was also its governor. One translation of Tachnama gives his name as Bandar Khan Buddh Samani, while other sources give his name, other translations give his name as Budra Khan Samani. And Budra Khan means one who is protected by Buddha in Sindhi. The people of Nerun opened the gates for Muhammad bin Qasim and informed him that they had also decided to send a letter to Hajjaj so that they can become loyal subjects of the Caliph. And so they demanded amnesty which Muhammad bin Qasim gave them. Once this was all settled, the people of Nerun court told Muhammad bin Qasim that they are with him against Raja Dahir and he was allowed to take any supplies he wanted. Nobody was harmed in the city. After Nerun, Muhammad bin Qasim decided to capture the nearby city of Sivistan. Like Nerun, Sivistan also had a Buddhist population but the governor here was a Hindu. He was none other than Raja Dahir's own cousin Bachira whose name in some other sources is given as Bhojrai, the son of Chandra, brother of Chach. He wanted to put up resistance but the people did not agree with him so in the end he had to leave and once he left the people opened the gates and were all spared. Sivistan also became a loyal subject of the Caliph from that day onwards. Now Muhammad bin Qasim decided that it was time for the final showdown with Raja Dahir who was situated on the other side of the Indus River. He needed to cross the Indus River in order to intercept Raja Dahir or you can say in order to face him but the problem was how to do it. He did not have the resources to cross the river. While Raja Dahir's men on the other side were mounted on horses and even elephants which was something quite common in amongst the rulers of Indian subcontinent. It was at this point that a Sindhi Buddhist chief named Moka came forward and gave Muhammad bin Qasim boats to cross the Indus River and they, his soldiers also built a temporary bridge so that they could cross the river and meet the forces of Raja Dahir. But on the other hand Raja Dahir also knew what to do. So while Muhammad bin Qasim was Cross, planning to cross the river, Raja Dahir quickly sent his son Jay Singh to stop Muhammad bin Qasim's men from crossing the river because he knew that if they managed to cross the river, things might get a little tough for him. Unfortunately for Raja Dahir, his son Jay Singh could not stop the Muslim army from crossing the Indus River and by the time he reached they had already crossed and the little battle which he put was in the end useless. The two sides faced each other and Raja Dahir came mounted on an elephant and thought he had the high ground. However, his false illusion quickly died out when a missile struck the trunk of his elephant and the panicking elephant threw Raja Dahir into the river. What happened was that they both went right into the river. But Raja Tahir managed to, managed to get up and return to the battlefield this time on horseback and was killed. Once the battle was over, his body was also found. And once it was recognized, his head was cut off and according to some sources first shown to his queens, while most agree that it was just sent over to the caliph. His body was just left there and we don't know about his last rites if they ever took place. 
Once Raja Dahir was killed, many of his followers fled from the battlefield and only some fought till the end. However, this by no means indicated that the conquest of Sindh was over. In fact, it was far from over. One of Dahir's wives, Rani Bai, barricaded herself in the nearby fortress of Ravar with 15,000 men and offered unexpected resistance. Soon it became very clear that the people of the fortress had chosen to rather die than surrender. But in the end, she too realized that further resistance was useless. And once the Muslim troops started entering, everyone in the fortress was either killed or enslaved. And lots of women, including the Rani herself, committed suicide by burning, which is the Johar ritual, to avoid capture. And although many people do associate Johar ritual with Muslim invaders and conquerors, historian Veena Talwar writes that it actually began long before. And the reason for its beginning was that many Rajput clans and princes were fighting each other. And the women did not wish to be dishonored by their rivals, so they chose suicide in a way that not even their bodies would be found. All would be found would be their ashes. After conquering Ravar, Muhammad bin Qasim decided to proceed to the city of Brahmanabad, which was commanded by Dahir's son, Jay Singh. Another widow of Raja Dahir, Rani Ladi, was staying there with two of her daughters, Surya Devi and Premala Devi. Brahmanabad did put up resistance under the command of Jay Singh and the Muslims suffered losses. But then he decided to leave because the siege seemed to go on forever. It had already been six months and no decisive change was occurring. And in the end, what happened was that the city surrendered, but because they had shown resistance, Hajjad's orders were followed. Judge Nama gives us some details. It says that the military class men were executed. It gives their number as 6,000, but says that it could have been 16,000 as well. Lots of citizens were also taken prisoners and a fifth of spoils along with 20,000 prisoners were sent to Hajjaj while the rest prisoners and spoils were distributed amongst the soldiers and while the prisoners who were commoners, traders and artisans were all forgiven. Muhammad bin Qasim also received complaints from the city's Hindu and Buddhist priests who said that they wanted to know if they could be allowed to receive charities from the locals. Muhammad bin Qasim wrote to Hajjaj who surprisingly didn't just allow them to collect donations but he also allowed them to repair their temples. Religious freedom was announced in Brahmanabad officially by Muhammad bin Qasim. And now Hindu monks could beg for donations in the city in copper bowls. That was the rule. Now Muhammad bin Qasim decided to move towards Sindh's largest and capital city, Aror. And on the way, rural people came and asked him for mercy. He granted it to them and told them to pay the jizya tax. Fofi, an other son of Raja Dahir, was commanding the defense here, and he refused to believe that his father was dead. He continued saying that his father had gone to India to collect a large army. And he told the Muslims, you better surrender or else you're going to regret it. But Judge Nama says that the nobility wanted to know whether Dahir was alive or not because if he was alive then only they, they should hold out but if he was dead then there was no point in resisting. So they went to a Hindu Jogi who knew a lot about magic and stuff and he revealed after some rituals that he does not know anything about Raja Dahir since his defeat. In other words his rituals say that he is not on the surface of this earth and so he is most likely dead. After knowing this, the people decided to discuss the peaceful surrender of the city. Now a mystery is what happened to Rani Ladi. One source says that she was shown the head of Raja Dahir and she committed suicide, while some say she just heard the news and committed suicide. Yet, there are some other sections of the Chachnama itself which give a very different story, which is the one you can see on screen. And it is hard to say which one is real because both appear 
in the same book written by the same author. Why some parts of Chachnama are a bit weird? We will discuss that in another video as well. So as mentioned earlier, the talks prevailed in the end because the yogi had announced to everyone that most likely Dahir is dead. So now only those soldiers who refused to submit to Muhammad bin Qasim were killed while the rest were allowed to live. Chachnama says that this was done upon the request of the Rani who told Muhammad bin Qasim that the people of the city are very creative and a genius person will spare them, not harm them. Chachnama says that as soon as the city was handed over to the Muslims, all the non-Muslim population happily went to a temple and prostrated themselves before an idol. The Chachnama officially uses the word Buddh temple and this means that the people of Brahmanabad were largely Buddhist because they were worshipping an idol of Buddha. So Muhammad bin Qasim asked the people where are these people going? And the locals told him they are going to the Novahar temple, also known as Novahar temple. So he visited the temple and saw a large idol of Buddha made of marble or alabaster wearing two bracelets. And he secretly took away one bracelet and asked the priest, So this is your idol? And he replied, Well, yes, but a few moments earlier he was wearing two bracelets and now one is gone and I have no idea where it is. And with this, he bowed down his head. And Muhammad bin Qasim said, Well, can't your God tell who took it? And laughed. Because he knew that, because Muslims don't worship idols. And then he placed the bracelet back on the idol's arm, the way it was. Another famous event that also took place at this time was this. A Brahmin was sentenced to death and he was about to be executed. When he said to the guard, Hey, don't kill me, I have got something really cool for you. He asked, What's that thing? And he re the Brahmin replied, I will show it only to your Amir. So he said, Okay, I will bring the Amir. But the Brahmin said to Muhammad bin Qasim, That promise you will spare me and all the people who depend on me if once I show you the thing. And Muhammad bin Qasim agreed and told him, Show me the thing. The Brahmin unfolded his beard and said, he untied it and said, Look, I've got the longest beard you have ever seen. It goes all the way to my feet. The guards claimed that this Brahmin had cheated them because according to them, a beard was nothing special. It was just a normal beard. But Muhammad bin Qasim said a Muslim must keep his promise. But upon pressure, he held the Brahmin and his dependents hostage and sent a letter to Hajjaj asking him, about what to do. He told him that this guy said he has a thing and it turns out that thing is basically his beard. Hajjaj replied that you must keep your promise and the Brahmin was released along all his dependents. Muhammad bin Qasim also sent letters to the Sindhi noblemen who were previously loyal to Raja Dahir. In these letters he gave them the choice that if they converted to Islam and submitted to him they will be forgiven and announcements were also done publicly. One of the noblemen who agreed was Raja Dahir's wazir, Siyakar. He came to Muhammad bin Qasim and embraced Islam, thus becoming one of his, close, one of his loyal officers. Muhammad bin Qasim accepted him in his service, and then he was the one who told him that he brought something for him. When Muhammad bin Qasim asked, he brought all the women who had been captured earlier by the Sindhi pirates. Once Aror was also captured, there was another city that Muhammad bin Qasim needed to capture and this was Multan. Multan was the second most prosperous city in Sindh after Aror. And all the way to Multan, there was a fort called Golkanda. This was conquered after crossing the river Bees and the city had shown some resistance under its rulers, so 4,000 soldiers were executed and their dependents were imprisoned while the rest were speared. Then Muhammad bin Qasim reached Multan and began the siege. And the siege lasted for six months and he lost 20 companions and 215 soldiers. But then 
uh, defector came out and asked for amnesty. Once it was granted, he told Muhammad bin Qasim that he knows a way into the city. According to him, there was a stream at the northern side of this castle, the Multan Fortress. And from there, they could easily dig their way into the city because it wasn't well guarded. Well, the plan worked and the ruler of Multan, Kundrai, escaped. 6,000 soldiers were executed for showing resistance while the people, including the artisans, merchants, and the agriculturalists, were all pardoned and obliged to pay the jizya. Jizya is a tax which non-Muslims living in Islamic state are supposed to pay. The Sun Temple of Multan was spared and the gentry and nobility of Multan arranged 60,000 dirhams of silver and each Muslim horseman was given 400 silver dirhams as his share. Then Muhammad bin Qasim was talking about arranging the tribute to the Caliph when Abrahmin came out of nowhere and spoke up that in Multan there lies treasure belonging to a monk prince. This was very surprising for Muhammad bin Qasim. What happened was that Multan was once ruled by a Kashmiri Brahmin king named Jaswin who was descended from the king of Kashmir. He was so rich that he built a cistern measuring 100 by 100 yards in the eastern side of Multan and built a temple 50 yards long and 50 yards wide in the cistern center. And under this temple he buried 40 large copper jars and marked that exact spot with an idol he made out of gold with two eyes made of ruby. When Muhammad bin Qasim saw this idol, he thought it was a warrior and was about to strike it with his sword when a priest told him, Amir, this is just a statue built by Jaswin. Around the cistern, Jaswin had also planted some trees and the idol was removed upon the orders of Muhammad bin Qasim. It waited around 230 months and one month is around 40 kg of gold. While the treasure in the copper jars altogether weighed, weighed 1,320 mounds of gold. The idol and the treasures were then moved to the public treasury and a proportion of the captured treasure was sent to the caliph's agent, Hajjaj bin Yusuf. Then Muhammad bin Qasim followed Hajjaj's advice to set up his residence in either Aror or Multan and he chose Multan because he liked it and dispatched an army to Kanoj in India which would later be beaten back. He also built a mosque with a lofty turret in Multan according to the Chachnama and dispatched the state's share of his spoils by boat to the Caliph via Dibal and the women who were brought by Siakar were also returned to Damascus. He gathered a regular army of 50,000 equipped horsemen in case the neighboring Hindu princes attacked. Then he also visited the Kashmir frontier and found many fir trees. The locals told him that this tradition was started by church to mark Sin's borders with Kashmir, and Muhammad bin Qasim ordered the tradition to be continued. He also planted some trees and the frontier with Kashmir remained the way it was. Now you might wonder what happened to Raja Dahir's family? How did Muhammad bin Qasim die and what happened to Sin after him? Well, this will be discussed in another video of this series, so make sure you subscribe our channel and press the bell icon so you will be notified when the next part of this series comes out. For now, I would like to thank all of you for watching and I will see you all later. And thanks to all the acknowledgements you can see on my screen. My references are provided here.